Greetings and welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. This is Robert Phoenix broadcasting to you live from Aston, Texas. I just love saying that. My kids started saying y'all now. My God. My son, born in San Diego, is saying y'all now. He's become a Texan. Born in San Diego. Learned to surf in San Diego. Now he's sporting the y'all. Hey, how is everybody out there? It is a lovely day here in Austin, beautiful fall day. It's one of the best times to be here. If you ever wanted to come visit Austin, this is a very good time. However, I think Formula One was either this weekend or is this weekend or next weekend, or last weekend. Not always a good time to come here during Formula One because a lot of people from all over the world come here to watch the races out at our wonderful racetrack. Got a world-class racetrack out there. They have a lot of concerts out there. They, they, they were smart. They built a concert venue inside the racetrack so they can use that racetrack all year round and have live performances. Not a bad thing to do out in the unincorporated area of Austin, Texas. It's a unique racetrack too, nonetheless. What's going on out there? How is everybody today? Ah, uh, yes, it's another day in the neighborhood. And we're gonna cover a few things today uh, and uh, one, of, one of the things I'm covering today actually comes from one of the listeners. It came to my attention yesterday. Got a couple of good things that came through uh, from the listener side. Well, first of all, I did a, 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 an interview with uh, Steve uh, Krimi yesterday, and uh, we talked about Blade Runner 2049, and we're going to air that uh, on Friday. It's about an hour conversation with Steve and Chris. And he's got some really interesting things to say about the movie and some add-ons to what I've kind of uh, uncovered. And I also want to take it one step further and talk about Taylor Swift's new video, which you cannot see because I'm talking about this on the radio, but I encourage you to look it up. And we're, we'll get into that a little bit later uh, in the show. And then uh, another uh, thing that came out of yesterday's show, when we were talking about what's happening here in Texas with the, the city of Dickinson down in Galveston County and how you have to sign off on a, basically a fealty oath and pledge to Israel in order to get your funds so that you can rebuild your life again, which is just to me the, the most um, egregious form of extortion. And uh, some of the things that came out of that, uh, of course, was this idea that we've got to get rid of the... The, the, this component that allows people to serve in our government with dual citizenship. And I can't agree with that more. It was, I completely agree with that. It doesn't matter what the country is. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Israel or Egypt or Turkey or, um, I don't know, you know, Thailand. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, what, if, what if somehow, for some reason... We had somebody in our government who was, uh, I'm sure this has happened already, but let's just, let's, let's bring it above the line, uh, that they were a, a citizen of Russia or the, or the former Soviet Union, and they were uh, also a citizen of the United States, and they were serving in the Congress and or the Senate. How would people feel about that? How, how would, how would the, uh, the vaunted left feel about that. Well, that's the case with Israel. We have dual citizens who are able to serve in the government. And in, um, in some, some cases, uh, to, to an egregious effect. I mean, a lot of people don't remember this, but a guy by the name of Dov Zakim was the head of the, he was the treasurer of the Pentagon. And he was the treasurer of the Pentagon just before 9-11. And, uh, well, guess what? Uh, what was it? $5 trillion or some astronomical amount of money went missing through the Pentagon. And that was, that was essentially um, addressed by uh, Donald Rumsfeld the day before 9-11 happened. And then Dov Zakim left and he went back to Israel. See, a lot of these things just get covered up and swept under the rug. Uh, so he was a dual citizen. Michael Chertoff's a dual citizen. Again, it doesn't matter what the country is. There's, there's a level of being compromised. So I think it would be really good if somebody somewhere out there had the cojones to write a bill that said no more dual citizens. I guarantee you, it would not get passed. 
but it would be great to at least write the bill and bring bring it up to the attention of the public and have a, a nice little look-see into that. So apparently 50 governors have signed off on this fealty pledge, this pledge of loyalty, the, the, the oath of loyalty uh, to the nation state of Israel, that if you boycott them, you will be, I don't know, you know, hung, hung, hung hanged, drawn and quartered, taken out to the stocks. Uh, so apparently uh, that's happened already. Every, fifth, every, every governor, 50 states, that came through one of the, one of the listeners. Uh, another listener who goes by the name of Nunya Biz brought this to my attention yesterday. I'm going to read this to you, and then we're going to, we're going to talk about this a little bit here. Let me see if I can find his. Uh, he says, uh, interesting things happening in the town where I live in West Virginia. We had an abandoned shovel factory where DuPont was storing strong plastics to spontaneously catch fire. The local firefighters weren't able to put the fire out themselves, and no federal help was called FEMA, National Guard, etc. So they're, they're dealing with this on their own. They've been letting the fire burn for three days now. Our town is currently covered in a large amount of toxic smoke that reeks of horrible stench of burnt plastic. There is almost no coverage on this on any national news yet, which is quite strange considering almost a million people are being affected by the toxic fumes. The authorities declared that the smoke is not hazardous but they went ahead and canceled school in a broad area. Even federal buildings and banks are telling their employees to go home. Many people are wearing medical masks, and the stench is, is unbearable in some areas. Now, this is pretty significant, and it is not getting any attention. But I, I did look it up, and um, this is what we have here. It says the Justice, Governor Justice declares state of emergency in West Virginia tool plant fire. So the fire blazes uh, for hours at Old Ames Plant in Parkersburg. No injuries reported. Well, okay, that's great. No injuries are reported, but we've got these uh, incredibly uh, dangerous fumes that are being burnt and sent into the air. And I, I just pulled up a... I'm going to read this to you here. I'm going to get some video. It's going to pop, and I have to make sure that it doesn't... Uh, interfere with the broadcast because okay let's try this so this is from Parkersburg West Virginia West Virginia Governor Jim Justice has declared a state of emergency in a county where fire at an old warehouse continues to smolder the governor says in a news release that poor air quality around the former Ames plant in Parkersburg contributed to the declaration it's a state of emergency okay this is kind of big which allows essential emergency resources to continue without interruption in battling the fire the declaration will run for 30 days unless justice terminates or extends it. The main fire at the 420,000 square foot warehouse, there's that number 420, kind of interesting, extinguished Saturday. Uh, rainfall on Monday helped with other hot spots, although the smoke intensified Monday and remained close to the ground. Close to the ground. The plant, was, which was closed in 2005, was being used to store recyclable plastics. Residents near the plant were urged to remain indoors if possible. Public schools are closed in a West Virginia county where fire continues to smolder. Rain was forecast on Monday. Uh, the weather forecast of concerns over smoke prompted officials to call off classes in Wood County, West Virginia. At Parkersburg, schools also are closed. Uh, uh, West Virginia University of Parkersburg also closed the main campus Monday. Many are worried what the effects of the smoke may do to you if you breathe it in. Camden Clark started preparing for the aftermath effects of the fire around 9 a.m. Saturday morning. They called in their pulmonologist, a doctor who focuses on health of the respiratory system, Dr. Abi Khalil. So to be cautious, got to be cautious with those fires. So be cautious. Take smaller breaths. Don't breathe in too much. If you breathe in too much, you'll take in too many of the noxious fumes, so cut your breaths uh, in half or three quarters if you can. In fact, try not breathing at all. Uh, the smoke contains some chemicals, and this could be a problem, especially for people who have some breathing problems like COPD, asthma, or some occupational breathing problem, he said. Occupational breathing problem. 
I mean, is that when people go to work, they start to breathe shorter breaths because they're filled with anxiety about their job. Uh, the hospital also gathered the necessary supplies to treat potential victims and called in nurses, extra nurses. Initial air monitoring uh, tested uh, showed air to be within acceptable quality limits. Ah, uh, yes, those wonderful acceptable quality limits, whatever they are. Lubeck volunteer fire chief Mark Stewart told the Parkersburg News and the Sentinel that firefighters from 31 departments from West Virginia and Ohio responded. Officials said the main fire was put out Saturday, but some hot spots remain. No injuries were reported, although Camden Clark Hospital spokesman Roger Lockhart says a few people sought treatment for breathing issues due to the smoke. Former workers at the plant recall it favorably as hard-working Ames. You can find more information about the fire and its aftermath from WHSV's sister station in Parkersburg. Um, okay, so we've got a major incident happening there. It's really not being covered by the national news uh, at all, and it's still going on. So if we look at this from kind of a larger perspective, now, okay, let's, let's, let's just drill down on this for a second. Could this just be a random fire? Could this just be something where somehow, somehow, uh, these plastics got ignited? Hmm, how would that happen? If the warehouse is abandoned and they're just storing these recyclable plastics, who knows what that really means, by the way? I mean, they could have really intense kinds of plastic compounds. Now, remember, down in Houston, when we had the, the big flood down there, there were a number of plants, and one in particular, that was on fire, and also it was a, it was a chemical plant. It was another one of these kinds of um, solvent plants. Um, and uh, not only was it on fire, but the groundwaters had risen up so high that I would, I would bet that a lot of the solvents and chemicals that were at this plant leached into the into the groundwater and is now kind of being uh, subsumed by the groundwater in Houston. And that was the one that we heard about, knew about. I'm sure that there were probably at least one or two more that were threatened uh, and impacted during the, the flood because that's where all the refineries and are, are located down, down in that part of Houston, not just uh, petroleum refineries, but other, other refineries that are related to the petroleum industry. They may not be directly involved in refining oil, but they could be related to some pro form or process of that, um, of that, of that um, operation and process. Anyway, uh, how does this happen? How does this happen in this plant in West Virginia? Is just spontaneously combust? Did the plastics just, you know, after so many years, uh, develop a high degree of volatility and flammability? I, it, it's a good question. Are there people going in there and hanging out and squatting and doing drugs? And maybe they're, um, I don't know, uh, they fell asleep and their meth pipe was on fire or lit. Uh, or was it deliberately was it deliberately lit? I mean, we can't rule anything out. And you think, well, okay, it's just a chemical fire in West Virginia, but it's affecting a lot of people. And if we zoom out again from that forty thousand foot level, we can see that there is a lot going on, right? I mean, just since the eclipse, so it's going to put us right around the first of September. I mean, here we are. This is the 24th of October, so a little less than 60 days. A little less than 60 days, what do we have? We have what? We had Hurricane Harvey, huge. That was right in the aftermath of the eclipse, enormous. And that event was real. It was totally real. It was, I mean, look, was it, was it amplified? Was it steered? Quite possibly. We had uh, our, the uh, companion, uh, Hurricane Irma, and of course, we had Maria and uh, uh, Jose, Mary and Joseph. And that's all happening. It's all happening within the last 60 days. And then we have the spontaneous eruption, the spontaneous combustion, 
fires in Northern California. Uh, and we had Vegas. So, so within really a, about a, about a 60 day span, and then we could throw in this fire in, in West Virginia, uh, which is impacting a huge amount of, it feels like, it really, really feels like that there is an assault on this country, whether it's due to some kind of uh, potentially directed energy weapon, which a lot of people in Santa Rosa um, are starting to begin to think about. Even people who might have been really conservative about their thoughts, they're trying to piece together how this kind of insane set of circumstances has occurred and how quickly those fires spread and how it feels like you know they were they were really cordoned off and targeted because a lot of the outer line areas like the vineyards they were left alone and of course opus one the rothschilds vineyard was untouched so if we can see a larger pattern here kind of at work or at play we might be able to make this kind of leap in our reasoning that there is a war going on here and it's not a, it's not standardized warfare it would be asymmetrical warfare against this country and the people of this country and the resources of this country and i don't think it's too far-fetched i'm not necessarily being paranoid and if you go back to 9 11 2001 by the way if you go back there that's when the war really started it's when it started and we've been at siege ever since. We've either been at siege overseas or it feels like we've been at siege with ourselves, perhaps. At least that's what the media would like to portray. Um, whether it's our friend in Aurora uh, going nuts and doing shootings or uh, Adam Lanza or you know, whomever it is, right? The, the, the populace of the United States becoming weaponized against its own self. Uh, that may or may not be the case. In fact, it's probably really not the case. But can you see this overall pattern now begin to emerge? That there really is a war going on here, and it's asymmetrical warfare. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a difficult or challenging idea to wrap your head around. Because, uh, you know, who is the enemy, question mark, and why? Well, the why really ultimately comes down to, number one, fear. Think of Harvest 91. What does the word harvest mean? Right. What does that mean? Well, to harvest is to bring something in. So there's a harvesting of energy when these events happen. It's the harvest of fear. It's the harvest, harvest of anxiety. It's the harvest of restlessness. The existential dread. This is, this is really the cauldron where it's all seeping. Right? So, I'm sorry, I'm not seeping, but it's all, it's all simmering in a cauldron of fear. This is what happens with these events. And it's sometimes it's a kind of a low, like a, like a low, uh, low level fee, low grade fever. And it's kind of happening in the back burner, but it's still there, right? Can you really disconnect from this sense that, you know, that the world is a dangerous place at times? Some people can't. And some people take this incredibly seriously. Like they see these things and they can't break them down. They can't decipher them. And that's really the hardest thing uh, to do because uh, dispelling the fear is one of the most important things we can do. So I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it out there that if you look at the overall pattern, really since 9-11-2001, it feels as though kind of, you know, we're at war. And, and the, the, the why really comes down to, just, it's the harvest piece. At an energetic level, I think that's probably the most essential one. The other is, when we've talked about this before, is the reallocation of assets and the relocation of people into a living situation, into a community that is being created in these uh, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 zones, so that ultimately people can live safe lives that they can eliminate the plastic plants, that they can get out of the suburbs, which would explode at any time. Uh, I think that this is, again, kind of the overall theme that's taking place and driving it into people's brains and driving... Where are those people in Santa Rosa going to go, by the way? 
Where are they going to go? There's no place really for them to go unless they rebuild, and that rebuilding process can take a long period of time. You know, what happens if we, you know, in Santa Rosa, let's say you do have the money to rebuild your house. What do you, so you build your house and everybody else can't, and, and you're living in, for all intents and purposes, a bomb site. What's that going to be like? Oh, hey, honey, let's have some coffee this morning and stare out over the charred remains of our neighborhood. You know, that's just, that's not going to work. I mean, people need to be able to derive some pleasure out of their living experience. So is all of this really just a very complex plan to herd people into living situations that are being pre-planned for us? Quite possibly. And perhaps there's even more to it. But if you look at these events as single, solitary, random events, they don't necessarily make a lot of sense. They may just seem to be random that these things happen. But when you put them together, maybe I should do this. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, before Thursday, let's try, let's try to let's try to round this up and and, uh, and come back on Thursday. I'm going to look at as many events post 9/11 2001 in this country and create a list. And I'm going to read that list off on Thursday, so that we can have a a larger view of a pattern. Because when we get to elevate ourselves and look down at what's happened. We may be very surprised to see everything that's occurred since 9 11 2001. Okay, let's do that on Thursday. Let's circle back on Thursday, 48 hours from today, and um, we're, gonna, we're going to explore this notion that there is, in, 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 a, in a more complex way, in, 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 in a, that there is a war going on in this country. And it's been taking place since 9 11 2001 in a big way. Okay. All right, so we've got that. Um, another piece here, which I thought was very interesting, to bring it to your attention, is there's a family that is suing the MGM. Uh, I think it's the MGM. Let me just, this is from uh, Fox News. Uh, this is interesting. It says the family of a 21 year old college student who was left with shattered ribs and a lacerated liver after being shot in the Las Vegas massacre wants answers from festival organizers and hotel management. One of her attorneys told Fox News as police continue to remain tight-lipped about the massacre. Paige Gasper, a Sonoma State University student, not far from Santa Rosa, by the way, uh, was working three jobs and saved up for a $236 ticket to the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival, the Harvest of Souls Music Festival, uh, before she was hit by a bolt from Stephen Paddock, who was firing out of his room on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino. Now, we know that Stephen Paddock was a patsy, and there's a very uh, good chance that um, he did not fire any shot at all. Paddock killed 58 people. See, Fox News is signing off on the, uh, on the official story here. Uh, 58 people in the October 1st attack and left hundreds of others like Gasper injured. A kid like that expects two simple things, to have a good time at a concert and to be saved. Two gal. This is Michelle Simpson, two gal. Uh, the attorney. The lawsuit and at least one other like it so far is filed against MGM Resorts, International, Live Nation Entertainment, and a bump stock maker among other parties. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So this is a lawsuit that's got uh, not just some uh, investment in the actual casino and the, and, the, and the festival organizers, but a bump stock maker. Interesting. They feel like things need to be safer, Tugel said when asked about how Gasper's family feels about the situation. Interesting. Las Vegas is having a tough time having a very, very difficult time in the aftermath. Who, what city wouldn't be? I mean, think about it. If that happened in your town, whatever happened, and we're still trying to figure it out, apparently there's been a major conflict between Jim Fetzer and Jeff Rents. And Jim Fetzer has had his radio show on Jeff Rents' network. Jeff Rents, one of the ways he makes money is he has a subscription. He has all these ads on his website, number one. Uh, number two, he makes uh, uh, money 
uh, through a subscription service to his radio broadcast where you can at times listen for the first hour and you've got to pay for the second hour. And he also uh, sells radio space on his bandwidth, which I think he I think he gets from GCN, if I'm not mistaken. So he buys the bandwidth uh, and then he and he sells out hourly segments. And Jim Fetzer uh, has had a radio show on his network for a long time. And uh, J- Jim, I'm sorry, Jeff, has had Jim Fetzer on as a guest frequently. And Jim, and Jim Fetzer is one of these guys that's everywhere. I mean, he is ev- I don't even know how the guy sleeps. You know, he's on, he's on this radio show, on that radio show, on that. I mean, he's, all, he's all over the place. He's writing books. He's on radio shows. I mean, how does he get it all done? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, they've had a falling out because... Uh, Jim Fetzer has been uh, seduced by Miles Mathis, and Miles Mathis says that absolutely nobody died in Las Vegas, that nothing happened there. It was all just a, another scripted event. That may or may not be true. The, I think, this is my theory about Las Vegas, I think it was a PSYOP within a PSYOP. I think that there are people that were not hurt. I think they had the crisis actors, and I think a lot more was going on there in Las Vegas than just the purported uh, Stephen Paddock event, which we know that that's the case. So we eliminate Stephen Paddock from from the equation. Uh, So what really went on? Did people actually get hurt? Were people actually wounded? Did people die? If not, okay, and here's the deal, right? Whether or not, whether or not people actually died or not, The outcome of the event, theoretically, is still the same. The only thing that is different is the blood sacrifice that would be associated with it, like the harvest, right? I think what would be really important, now there's gag orders, there's all kinds of things going on. The police aren't talking about it anymore because they can't get their story straight. Um, There was a a federal, I believe it was a, a state ordered to stop destroying evidence because the MGM was, wasn't, uh, was, destroying evidence. I think a lot of things could be cleared up if we just was, were able to see uh, the video from the MGM, boy, or, or Mandalay, wouldn't that be interesting? You know, hotel with all these cameras, city wired up. Another thing that would be very helpful is to talk to some first responders, talk to people at the various hospitals. Uh, that would be a really interesting thing to do because they have emergency rooms. Uh, ultimately, people would have been taken to the three emergency rooms around the Vegas area. And none of the people at these hospitals have come forward and said, we dealt with this tragedy, we dealt with all these bodies and blood. And, you know, it, so, you know, I, I think that that would be very helpful for us to understand what really went on. Anyway, um, but, but the outcome of it is still going to be the same. They're going to go after the bump stocks and the weapons and more surveillance and more cameras and more rapid scan, more body scan. I mean, that does, so to some extent, to some extent, it doesn't matter like what, if people actually died or not in terms of what happens on the backside of this, right? Because what happens on the backside is what they're going to do anyway, problem, reaction, solution. But in a, in a more personal sense, of course it matters. Because theoretically, we care about human life. And we care about it. You know, we're tribal animals. Tribal creatures. So Fetzer is at odds with Jeff Rents Because he's, he's, he's uh, sipped Miles Mathis' Kool-Aid. Miles Math- Mathis is a really smart guy. I don't always agree with everything Miles Mathis has to say. And particularly to Ken, his, his idea that Kennedy didn't die. And the reason why I don't agree with that is because one of my clients' husband is a brain surgeon. He's a, he's a much older man. He's a brain surgeon. And he was there in Dallas when Kennedy was wheeled in. He was there to deal with his brain trauma. Okay, so I actually know somebody who ha- whose husband dealt with the dying JFK. So Miles Mathis is wrong about that. He's wrong. Unless they brought in somebody who looked like JFK, some other, you know, if they went, they went to that much of a, 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 a to, to that much of a trouble to find somebody, shoot him twice, have a massive head wound, 
and say it's JFK, and then say, "Who hey, work on this guy?" I mean, that's going. That's that's quite a quite a bit of detail. That's going the distance to um, to sell something. Um, anyway, Rents and, and Fetzer are at odds now. In fact, Jeff Rents has cut Jim Fetzer loose from his radio show because Jeff thinks that people died, and Jim thinks they didn't. That's really the crux of it all. But the bottom line is, is that we're still not getting to the truth around Las Vegas, and people are going to continue to ask questions while the Kennedy files are being released. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out. Much of it will be redacted. And, you know, I feel like that, that there's ultimately going to be a significant letdown as people sort through this stuff, because I think that's what it's supposed to be. And uh, just keep moving along, keep moving along, keep walking, nothing to see here. Um, interesting that as we are delving into this Las Vegas piece, as we're trying to understand the absolutely futuristic and terrifying implications of what happened in Santa Rosa, as we're trying to piece together this larger pattern of what's taking place in this country and has been since 2011, Trump decides that he's going to open the Kennedy files. Fascinating. Um, real quick, I wanted to talk about Taylor Swift's new video. It's, wor it's, worth, it's worth looking at, if, even if you're not a Taylor Swift fan. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, here we go. So this is from the uh, Telegraph. And uh, Taylor Swift has a new album out. It's, her album is hitting on the 10th of November. Or, no, 10th of, it was the 10th of October, I think, 10-10. She, so she launched this at 10-10 on 10, 10 on 10, 10 Okay. I'm select woman Stacia Rice Living, um, building a strong, strong Essex economy. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Get out of there. All right. So this is from the Telegraph. Uh, co. Uk. She once claimed she did not need to remove her clothes to sell records, and Taylor Swift has employed a little creative ambiguity to stick to that message whilst at the same time appearing to be totally naked in a new video. The 27-year-old U.S. pop star on Monday released a preview of a music video for her latest single, Ready For It. Ready For It. In which she appears unclothed with geometric lines of lights across her body, although she is likely wearing a new colored bodysuit. So Taylor Swift has, has this video where she's theoretically uh, appearing nude, but she might be actually wearing a bodysuit. Now, what she really is, let me just read this here. In the teaser set in a futuristic sci-fi universe, boy, has the country music come a long ways? She's filmed walking down a corridor with a hood over her head. Before being tra before transforming into a get ready for it a robot or cyborg like being. Another segment shows the singer gazing into a floating glowing orb. Oh, it's the blue avions showing up in Taylor Swift's video. Uh, while another snippet sees her smashing through what looks like a glass cage. So essentially, what she's doing here is she's uh, becoming a replicant or an android. So this, this is the transhumanist cell. This is Taylor Swift's transhumanist cell out. So she's appearing nude, but maybe she's not nude, but it looks like she's nude. She's wearing a bodysuit, perhaps, 
um, that makes her look new. But in the video, she turns herself into an augmented human. So this is, we've gone from country and western music and this sort of pearly white, squeaky clean image to this transformed human becoming a cyborg, an augmented human. That's going to be the new thing. It's going to be the new sexy. Being human just isn't enough. And this is what Blade Runner 2049 gets into. It gets into this idea that androids are cool. Androids are virile. And they're macho, which is what Ryan Gosling portrays in Blade Runner 2049. It's, I think it's really interesting, too, just from a kind of a, a social image. Every now and then we get these films um, with Liam Neeson, who seems to be one of the few kind of, you know, white, over-middle-aged males who can play a hero. It's like he's got a hero contract somewhere. Like he signed a contract a long time ago. Says I'm going to be a hero, and so every every two years or so they they roll out a Liam Neeson movie. There's a new one now where he's on a train, rescuing people, and and Michael Keaton seems to somehow pop up in this role every now and then. But by and large, you know, by and large, the, these images of kind of the you know the white male as the hero are really being um, dispensed with. Uh, in a lot of ways. So when you have somebody like Ryan Gosling who shows up in this movie, Blade Runner 2049, it's like, okay, you can do this, you can play this role, but you're really a cyborg. You're really just an android. That's really... So it's like, okay, here you go. Here, here's an icon for you, but he's an android. He's not a real person. And he's not even living in contemporary times. Uh, anyway, that is the new sexy. It's like, ah, oh, look at that hunky android in Blade Runner 2049. And the women in Blade Runner 2049 are really compelling. There's, there's a hologram who's like incredibly warm and organic and uh, lovely and, and feminine. Oh my God, she mixes his, his drink as he comes home. He's an android. He can't even get drunk, but he's going to take a drink anyway because... Well, I guess it's the thing to do when you're an android coming home from a hard day of chasing down replicants. It's a fascinating juxtaposition in the movie where the characters, who are mostly non-human, portray very, very human kinds of emotions and human, human traits. And here's Taylor Swift jumping on board. Speaking of androids and augmented humans, uh, have you seen the picture of all the presidents who were at Texas A&M last weekend to do this fundraiser? So there's Carter, there's Obama, there's Pappy Bush sitting in the middle, and then there's W, and then there's Bill. And who's standing behind them in this picture? It's Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga, who looks like kind of a cross between Marilyn Monroe and Jackie Kennedy is standing behind all these presidents. She's wearing a white dress, blonde hair. It's, it's like the transmogrification of Lady Gaga. I mean, that picture is absolutely fascinating. Why did they choose to include her in that picture? I'll let some of the people in the uh, listening audience try to piece that together. Anyway, uh, Taylor Swift doing her part to move the transhumanist agenda forward in her latest video, and it's not selling well. The album isn't selling as well as it, it uh, as it has in the past, or her works have, her albums have in the past. I'm sure her fans are kind of befuddled, like what the hell is this? Taylor's just following her marching orders, doing what she's told, embracing the latest fashion, which is robotoid culture. All right, you're not robotoids. I know you're not. I know who you are. You're living, breathing, organic beings. Even though I only know you through your virtual selves. And with that, 
let us celebrate our humanity, let us celebrate our divinity, let us celebrate our divine and organic nature, our analog selves, each and every one of us. And remember that today, wherever you are, as you set forth, whether it's through work or through play, through solitude, through meditation, through spiritual practice, through physical practice, whatever it is, whatever it is, celebrate the fact that you are alive, that you have an earth suit, that you bleed, that you feel, that you crave, that you are emote, that you can experience things like ecstasy and elation, and you can feel deeply, profoundly, if you need to, that you are the widest and vastest array of the human experience possible. Don't ever forget that. Celebrate it. Because if you don't, guess what? It goes away. It goes away. And we wind up shrinking and becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And we lose touch with our humanity. And we ourselves have become robots, androids, unfeeling, programmed, soulless. All right. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. This has been 15 Minutes of Flame. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow, 24 hours from today. And on Thursday, we're going to come back and we're going to have a map. We're going to have a map of...